Amy Zawi with the Jerusalem Connection Red Alert Report for May 27th. What are three things you can do? Recently, I came across several separate communiques from various pro-Israel organizations offering some advice on tangible steps we can keep on hand to combat anti-Semitism right from our very own homes. So I'm stealing them to share them with you today. Number one support social media accuracy. And this is for articles and posts that you view and then you analyze carefully and fully. And these can be either supportive and correct regarding Israel and the Jewish people, or perhaps they are not. But you need to comment and share accordingly. Share and comment about facts that support the article or that will counter the article, but always do so with a reasoned and helpful tone. Two, to further your actions in step one, be sure you are seeking out article, articles and posts from social media, from celebrities, politicians, and even blog posts, and be sure to share timely information as you see it come across organizations from or individuals that are accurate, and you want to encourage those posts um, in order to keep them going. And number three, which I argue number three could also be number one. Pray. Ask God for a blessing, for the right spirit in you and the right spirit to make your post and public statement that will be helpful and beneficial. So I stole those from the uh, International Fellowship of Christians and Jews, paraphrasing them just a little bit. As well, two journalists in the past few weeks have echoed each other's sentiments with their original observations about the scapegoating of Jews in general and, of course, the nation of Israel, currently within the context of the corona COVID-19 crisis. Ruthie Bloom from the Jerusalem Post and Samantha Mendelez of Newsweek each had some very interesting articles posted in mid-May. Ruthie's article published on May 14th in the Jerusalem Post was cleverly articulating and illustrating the grim reality of COVID-19 being the very latest avenue on which anti-Semitism is rearing its ugly head. And then, of course, it gets casually accepted. Miss Bloom's wit and her grasp of the gravity of the situation made me read her article three times, and I didn't know whether to laugh or cry at her verbiage. Her title, Quote, the pandemic, like others before it, has incubated anti-Semitism. She then goes on to be in consistency with her metaphor about the COVID-19 virus and the age-old pandemic of anti-Semitism um, throughout the entirety of the article. And to me, this was profound because it was snarky even at times. And it was one more attempt to shake some sense into the many people who are dismissing or accepting anti-Semitism in a world hell-bent on the mantra of we're all in this together. And that this virus is running its course and will eventually die out, but it is currently the most dangerous thing on the planet. But in fact, it is not because anti-Semitism is not dying out. The following quote from Miss Bloom's article, but while quarantines were being imposed to flatten the curve, they simultaneously sparked an outbreak of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories about the ostensibly Jewish origin and spread of the infectious disease. Lockdowns also led to a burst of creative energy on the part of holdup cartoonists, whose work would have made the Third Reich proud. Unlike the Nazi propaganda machine, however, Today's cartoonists and characterists have the weapon of social media at their disposal. One that is proven immune to the vows by Facebook and Twitter to confront such posts with community standard algorithms. Yes, curbing the anti-Jewish expression on the internet by suspending individual posts is about as realistic a proposition as curing corona by donning a surgical mask. Especially with the massive amount of web traffic that home isolation has wrought. So this is why we all must do our part as consumers of social media to contribute to the conversations that these anti-Semites insist on starting on social media. Review those three steps I just outlined one more time. 
One example that Ms. Bloom shares in her article is a particular Twitter campaign called COVID-48, which is replacing the year of the emergence of the virus, COVID-19, with the year of the founding of the modern state of Israel, 1948. One element of this Twitter campaign is a series of cartoons portraying Israel as either the cause of the disease or the embodiment of it. Said tropes are coming from all sides of the anti-Semitism trifecta, the neo-Nazis, the radical Islamists, and left-wing activists. The article then cited a very serious study released by the Tel Aviv University the Acantro Center, whose studies I have had have cited before in my reports. In its annual report on anti-Semitism worldwide for 2019, which was just released this past April, quote, the return of traditional, classic, anti-Semitic stereotypes and in intensification of anti-Israel and Islamist anti-Semitism have contributed to the growing role of the anti-Semitic discourse that has moved from the fringes of society into the mainstream. The European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights revealed in its report that 41% of Jews aged 16 to 34 have considered emigrating from Europe over the last five years. This is due to anti-Semitism and the perceptions regarding government's responses to it, which were overwhelmingly considered inadequate by those polled. The report from Tel Aviv also notes the emergence of the U.S. in the U.S. of increased violent anti-Semitic manifestations with the shootings, the shooting sprees, and the numerous violent attacks and the casualties thereof. These are inspired mainly by right-wing ideologies and as well by certain groups within the Black Hebrew Israelites and the Nation of Islam. Perpetrators of major anti-Semitic violent attacks in 2019 were active in disseminating, disseminating anti-Semitic propaganda online through international networks of like-minded activists. Anti-Zionism uh, expressed in anti-Semitic terms was rampant among the left-wing activists as well, especially in reaction to the recent warm Israeli-American relations that have taken place with the current administration. They also depict Israeli-Jewish um, relations as deliberate attempts to disseminate and manipulate American policies and leaders. In Sam with Samantha Melendez's article in Newsweek, this caught my attention because of her very specific analysis of the past two months and the ongoings on social media, and specifically within the BDS movement. Samantha's article outlined the BDS movement having no stranger, being no stranger to appropriating various contemporary social issues to insert their own brand of hate. They've done this with the Black Lives Matter group, and they've done this with the Women's March here in the United States. Samantha outlines how the BDS groups now have done it with the coronavirus media surge. Historically, Jews have been associated with and blamed for various diseases and epidemic outbreaks. And in modern history, examples include the Nazi claim that Jews were, quote, a biological threat and Hamas saying for years, a couple decades anyway, that Jews use HIV-infected women to seduce and infect Arab men. And of course, there's Iran's constant analogy that Jews are a cancerous tumor in today's world. Today's latest iteration is, of course, the corona variation. The PA media outlets are casting Israel as the hand of the virus among the Arab, Arab populations, while Iran claims their own high mortality rate is somehow the fault of Jews using the virus as a bioweapon. Keep in mind that in the PA territories, very little social distancing is taking place. And Fridays are continually days of mass gathering and regular anti-Israel protests. The PA media claims that the CIA and Mossad have used COVID-19 to infect PA prisoners in Israeli prison, but to date there is no confirmed case of a COVID-19 patient among Palestinian prisoners in Israeli prisons. 
The cartoons and tropes circulating the Arab world and the local language media is altered just a bit for Western consumption so that so-called humanitarian efforts and groups in the West can accept them more readily. For example, in the, P in the PA, media there claims that IDF soldiers with COVID are spitting on Palestinians' cars in order to spread the virus. This actually made it into English language feeds and finally picked up by a New York City human rights attorney named Le Mestique. He then tweeted, no question, Israel sees hashtag corona outbreak as an ally and tool for ethnic cleansing and genocide of Palestinians. So, by the time this notion from the PA media gets into Western social media feeds, the assumptions are already accepted. Israel is engaging in ethnic cleansing and genocide. And that they're going to use a virus to their advantage in those activities. This kind of tweet gets largely no attention from any anti-hate or human rights watchdog groups. And that leads to the normalization of the message for today's audiences. Samantha goes on to explain that even by establishing the virus analogy to Israel, the attacks then bleed into the condition of the PA of Palestinians and that we can only blame Israel for the Palestinians' plight. No mention whatsoever about the continued medical supplies and training that Israel is offering to PA professionals and supply chains, let alone the lack of social distancing taking place in the PA. After de Blasio blasted a New York City Orthodox community for a funeral within, within its community, the mass gatherings for funerals in the PA for martyrs and terrorists goes on unmentioned. The BDS community cannot point out the culpability of the PA authorities and its, its people for their own misgivings because in so doing it will undermine their own narrative that everything that's wrong with the Palestinian situation is by the hand of Israel. Palestinians are only victims and Israel is only the aggressor. Samantha concludes her article with a very um, well put paragraph. Um, Anti-Zionist ideologues top priority is political warfare against Israel even when castigating or inciting violence against it directly threatens the Palestinians' lives. Such callousness alone should be enough to repel human rights activists. Instead, BDS symbolize, sympathizes with the Islamist autocracies, and this reveals BDS campaign's true illiberal nature. So remember, our three steps identify and support social media accuracy. Post about Jews in Israel. Support those with facts that are making excellent points and refute with reason and facts those that don't. Post timely information and pray. Don't scroll past, ignore, or turn a blind eye to anti-Semitism when it creeps across your screen, your newspaper, or your television. Contact the publishing agency. Ms. Bloom and Ms. Mendelez have, and others have been warning us that the normalization of anti-Semitism is how the virus grows to the point of killing. And it has already succeeded in many instances. Shavua Tov. Have a great week.